Mr. Hausman, good morning. Hope all is well. And we're going to take a look today at Ohm's Law, assignment number four. Uh, and the first thing we have to start with is a little bit of a further exploration of our model of electric current, uh, electric resistance, uh, as well as voltage. Uh, then we will be able to pull all three together. And what you should be using is either notebook paper or uh, your the PDF that I have posted, of course, of the electricity packet. So I'm on page five and let's get started. So really what I wanna introduce today or reinforce today is that electric current, we know what that is. It's think of it like water, but really in circuits, there's sort of like two kinds. Uh, and we're going to examine how the two kinds of current are different depending on the direction of the current. And you may say, well, well, which is it? Does it flow from positive to negative, negative to positive? Well, the direction of electric current by convention, which means kind of by agreement, by rule, is the direction of which positive charges move. Uh, and you might say, but they don't move at all. That's true, but it has to do with the discovery or the invention of electricity. We talk about positive charges moving really as what are called holes, uh, the lack of a negative particle uh, where an electron is missing from. It's, it's not around that atom. And those holes move when the electrons move. So this positive concept, really think of it as a lack of an electron. That's a really kind of tough idea to grasp, but let's maybe pretend that positives can move. And the definition of current, uh, again, uh, or conventional current, is it's the direction a positive charge would move away from the positive terminal and toward the negative terminal of a battery. Batteries always have positives and negatives. The positive terminal is the high potential end, and the negative terminal is considered the low potential end, referring to energy. So if protons move from positive to negative with the electric field, electrons drift toward the other way. They go from the low end to the high end, or at least the low potential to the high potential end. Uh, and the other way is that positives go toward the low voltage side or low potential side. So if you've got a circuit with a positive and negative terminal, the way there's two kinds of current. There's conventional current, which would be from positive to negative, and that would be the direction positive or holes move. And the modern kind of current, which would be the opposite way. So this is conventional. This is the modern definition. And they kind of are, it's not really that current goes two, to way, two different ways, but it's really the idea that current can be considered either one. The, what they have in common is that charges are being pushed in an electric field. So let's talk a little bit about this push uh, right here. So let's come up with a model. Um, maybe when you see a battery sitting on a shelf or in, you take it out of a remote control or out of a mouse uh, you might be using if you have a, of a separate mouse. And the reality is, is that you don't see a difference between the positive and negative end. So we're going to come up with a model. And that model here is about water tanks. I've also heard of water flowing down a stream, but let's use water tanks for now. If you need another example, we can do it. So this tank is clearly almost up to the brim. And if you've ever dove down in a swimming pool where there's a lot of water over your head, you feel a lot of pressure on your ears. And that pressure sometimes causes your ears to pop and you have to pinch your nose and maybe you've been snorkeling or diving. And that pressure causes the majority of the water in here to do what? Well, it moves from tank A to B. So the natural direction would be for the water flow to go from capital A, tank A, to tank B. But let's look at the second picture. Let's look at the other scenario. Well, what if the two tanks both have pressure, but the pressure is balanced? And the reality of that is, is that, well, there's still gonna be some water molecules randomly moving, but there's not gonna be a net flow. So in image B, is there any pressure difference? And the answer is no difference causes no net movement. Again, there's random movement. So what is this a model of? This is a model of a dead battery. So if you have a dead battery, you're not going to be pushing charges and your electronics are not going to light up and do their thing. Now, 
what if the water is flowing from A to B and you don't want the energy to quote unquote run out, the pressure to run out? Because eventually you'll get to, you'll, you'll go from picture A to picture B. And I guess that's a, that's a, you know, using up a battery. Well, what if you're able to pump it back? What if there's a, a little bit of an energy source put in and the result is that you now uh, have kind of a continuous flow? Well, I guess that's kind of what you're doing with your laptop, if you happen to have one open right now. And what I mean by that is this part is kind of the recharging step. You're rebuilding up that pressure difference and uh, so that your electronics can flow. So if your laptop is plugged in, you're putting energy in at the same time as the battery is pushing out to, uh, to, to make what the, the chips work, uh, to make some sound and to make some light come out of the screen. So um, just a, a model for thinking about how a battery works. It works because there's pressure difference. Uh, there's energy difference between uh, the positive and negative sign. If you, if you try a battery and it's not working, it's probably because the two terminals, the positive and negative end, are at the same energy level or same potential difference. Okay, so let's go into current flowing. Uh, to have current electricity, as opposed to static electricity, we need electrons to drift. Um, why don't we say, you know, uh, run or, or sprint or, or move? Well, the drift word tells you that it's actually a slow process. The drift speed of an electron in a wire that's powered up, you know, like, uh, you know, like, I don't know, I have no charging cables in, in sight, but the char uh, any cable, the drift speed, how fast are the electrons moving? They're actually moving approximately one meter per hour. And that doesn't seem like it makes sense. Electricity, the electric field, the overall pressure is very fast in a wire. When you turn on a circuit, when you put in a battery, all of a sudden it works. But what you should think of it is that in the wire, in the wire, uh, there's a whole bunch of electrons already in there. So when you create a pressure difference, maybe like an uphill versus downhill, the electrons are already lined up. Think of it like dominoes. That example, if you, you know the game of dominoes where you have a bunch of dominoes all stacked. And the moment you push one side, the, all the dominoes start to fall, but they, they do take a small gap between the start and the end, but it generally gets to the other end pretty quickly. Okay, so, but does this individual domino or this do individual domino run from one end to the other? And the answer is no. It really just leans over. It just kind of pushes the next one next to it. And that's what electrons do in a wire. Each electron bumps into another electron and that keeps the electricity flowing. So let's keep going. So we have to set up a potential difference, somehow a potential difference. Remember the symbol is delta V. Um, it's just reinforcing vocabulary, must be set up on the two edges. I guess you'd call them the two ends of the wires. Or it could be a, a piece of aluminum foil, for all we know. Uh, and to create that delta V, we just need one side be high potential energy and one side be low. The battery ultimately acts, acts excuse me, as a voltage source. Remember, voltage source, the word voltage is a synonym for potential difference. And so you need a potential difference. And that's what the battery does. So all batteries are is a positive region separated by a negative region. And there has to be some space or separator so that the charges don't move all at once. And in a battery, they kind of coil those positives and negatives, those two plates up, and they turn them into almost like a spiral. Uh, and... But at the very end, a wire is attached to this positive and negative, and that's what connects to the outside world. So what does a battery do? And this is a pretty important one. There's three key steps. Batteries provide energy, electrical potential energy. It's stored in the battery until the moment you hook up the wires or the conducting pathway. But the battery doesn't just have energy uh, because even a dead battery has energy. It has to have a potential difference or a... Um, uh, delta V. Uh, and basically, it maintains that delta V from one side to the other until the delta V is zero, and then the circuit will stop flowing again. Okay, take a break, um, pause, uh, think about what you just wrote, and let's go to the next page, 
when you're ready. Let's talk a little bit more about voltage. So um, again, we're not really fully going into battery technology, but the way that a battery works, and some of you know a lot of this from electrochemistry, is that um, in an electrochemical cell, one side has more uh, positive ions, and they can be single um, uh, metal atoms like sodium, potassium, and things like that. Uh, some of the more complex ones are now uh, small polymers that are charged. And that's at one end. And then there's also negative ions at, of course, the negative end. And some of you know those words like cation, uh, sorry, cathode and the anode of the battery. Uh, just uh, in case that's vocab that overlaps with chemistry, the positive said, side is the cathode, and you can remember cation and the anode is the negative side. And that's of course an anion. So um, the electricity field is created between the two ends of the battery. There is an electric field in a battery that when you connect a wire to it, that field then continues all the way through the wire. Um, and what we get here uh, is because electric fields are acting on charges in the wire, we're gonna get a electric force. And if you have forces, you cause charges to not just move, but technically to accelerate. They don't actually speed up in the wire uh, because of the resistance. So if net charges pass through a point, we ultimately get current, electric current. So the big idea, let's do a quick summary. How does energy kind of work in a circuit? So you have two sides of your battery. You have a positive and negative. Now this drawing created by Mr. Wadman, he's been doing it for probably more years than I've been teaching physics. He's really good at these little stick figures. So these little stick figures, each one of them is an electron. He's personifying electron, a pretty cool little drawing. Well, the electrons leave, let's actually, let me stop myself. They don't leave the battery. They're already in the wire. So they're kind of like this uh, army of electrons in the wire, loose electrons, right? That's what metals are. And they get pushed. But essentially what it's like is their basket or their backpack. Each electron has a little backpack on it and it gets loaded up with energy. We call that electrical potential energy. So when they leave or when they're on one side of the circuit and that's the side from the closest to the negative because we're talking about modern current, they, they keep moving and they're gonna keep their energy they're gonna keep their energy. You can bend the wire, you can branch the wire, you can do anything you want with it, but it's gonna keep that bucket loaded. And he's holding like a pot over his head, uh, maybe a water bucket. And then he gets to some device that has right the ability to convert that energy into something useful, like sound waves, right? So radios put out a little audio. Well, that's a form of energy. So the electrons energy gets converted into uh, another type. The general name for this, for this process of moving energy from the battery to the uh, to the load, right, right, is electricity. That's all. That's all it is. It's moving energy from a source to a to a load, and loads are useful for converting energy uh, to to maybe light in a flashlight or sound in a radio. So what happens to the electrons? They get destroyed, right? Definitely not. Electrons cannot be destroyed. They keep getting pushed, but they're after the load. So they're the other side of the battery on the other side of the circuit board or the, or the light bulb, and they get pushed back toward the battery, but notice they're missing their energy. So we talked once about how there's charges that can have high energy and low energy, depending on where they are in the electric field. And electrons have a lot of energy coming out of the, sorry, from the, from the negative side. So, energy um uh, let's let's actually go, go to the second big idea current or the charges are recycled the charges keep moving so the charges or in this case we're going to just say what they are the electrons flow continuously around the circuit uh they never stop uh they keep marching through again very slowly because they're 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 all in line kind of pushing into each other but the big idea here is that current is conserved. You, you never will uh, lose your current through that circuit uh, unless you have a short circuit and then it stops. Uh, I bet you've heard that word. We'll explore exactly what it means to have a short circuit when we get into the building of circuits. The second big idea, right, is that, let's write this, current conserved. 
The second big idea is that the uh, that the energy is transformed. It leaves the system, it leaves the wire, it leaves the electric pathway, and the electrical potential energy, right? is converted at the load. What is it converted to? Well, it can be sound, it can be light. I bet you're thinking of a few other things. I plug in a device and what else does it do? Oh, sometimes it causes movement, like electric cars or, or like a power tool. Um, but it, essentially, if you think of every device around you that gets a source of electrical energy, it's being turned into something else, like a sound, light, um, mechanical energy, and things like that. So I think we're, we're almost there, and there's one last idea in the world, that is resistance. So we've got current, we've got voltage from the battery, and or the voltage source is the battery, and then we've got resistance. So last key idea. And this is the one we've spent the least, idea, uh, the least amount of time on. So what is resistance? Well, resistance is essentially like, kind of like friction electrical friction it's it's a property of the material that you use so you could use copper you could use silver you could use a carbon fiber nanotube um that's a really exotic new kind of conductor that was uh, highly developed at rice university in texas uh there's a great youtube video on that um and uh even though carbon is usually a non-conductor when it's in a tube shape with covalent bonds, the electrons uh, are able to actually pass really easily through them. And it has a second benefit, it's incredibly strong. So how much does a, each material have for res uh, resistance? Well, it's a property called resist resistivity. So it's kind of like each metal, each, each material uh, has a measure of how many ohms of resistance, that's the unit, uh, per meter. So that tells you right off the bat that you have to standardize the length of the meter. But resistivity is um, just a, a foundational um, property. Uh, so for example, uh, let's take a look at some of these numbers and it looks like silver is actually one of the best conductors. Um, and so that's why they use them in high performance electronics and maybe you've plugged in uh, fancy headphones. Uh, so many of us are using wireless ones and they use silver connectors. And you go, no they don't, they use gold. Why don't they use silver? If silver is one of the best conductors, it's the lowest resistance on this list. Uh, the reason is because it's actually kind of chemically reactive. It corrodes. If anyone has silver jewelry, they know that it tarnishes. So if your electrical wire is gonna be exposed to air, silver changes its electrical resistivity very easily when it oxidizes. And no, it's, it's no longer silver, it's silver oxide. Uh, so that's why we tend to use copper and gold as the quote unquote better conductors. Uh, and then look at the, of course, things like glass and rubber. You can try to force electricity through something uh, like a non-conductor, but you have these incredibly large resistivities. Okay, there's two other factors that affect your resistance. So let's add them down here. So if resistivity is factor one, factor two is the area of the wire. So is it, does it have a small cross section? That's like cutting the wire in half, or does it have a large cross section? Um, so kind of like think of it as a thin pipe and a, and a really fat pipe, like the PVC pipes that might be in your basement for, for wastewater. And the larger area has low resistance, and the tiny little area has high resistance. It's kind of like trying to fit more things through a narrow uh, opening and you're gonna have some resistance to it. Uh, the third factor in resistance is the length of the wire. Longer wires have more resistance, shorter wires have much less. So if you're a, a you know, audiophile, someone who loves their speakers, uh, do you wanna run extra wire uh, through the walls and make sure it's like you know, twice as long as you need? Or do you run shorter wires? Well, if you want good quality audio, you don't want a lot of resistance in your wire. Uh, you pick high quality copper to begin with, and then you keep the length exactly the length it has to be uh, for that application. You know, nothing longer than it has to be. Um, the, there's actually another rule is if you're into audio and hook up speakers and things like that uh, with, with copper wires, is you want the two, if you have two speakers or four speakers, you want their lengths to be all the same. Uh, matching resistance is a big deal when it comes to audio quality at the at the prosumer end or the professional end. Okay, so that's our last variable. 
So believe it or not, it's the easiest part is pulling these all together. And that's referred to as Ohm's law. Ohm's law is a connection between the voltage at the battery, the current that gets pumped all the way through the circuit, and the resistance of whatever's in the circuit. Uh, most of the resistance is in the load, the, the filament of the light bulb or the, or the mechanical parts of the speaker that actually uh, make the, the speaker vibrate. Wires have, copper wires actually have such low resistivity uh, and resistance, we basically say the wires are not really resistors. But when we put those three together, voltage, current, and resistance, we get Ohm's law. Textbooks always write it as V equals IR. I personally really prefer you to think of it a different way. It's still going to be the same mathematical relationship, but we're going to rewrite it as I equals V over R. Because when you write it this way, you actually understand the definition better. Ohm's law is a mathematical formula that states that voltage or the potential difference, we sometimes get lazy and, lazy and don't write the delta V, the potential difference is the uh, is directly proportional to the current. So the harder um, the power source pushes on the charges, the more current you're gonna get. And resistance is inversely proportional to current. Um, and quick unit review, voltage is measured in volts. That's either easy to remember or kind of confusing. This is also a, a capital V. We use delta V for voltage. The unit for resistance is this thing called an ohm. Um, and uh, it's a Greek letter, it's an omega, but it's like an upside down horseshoe. I make it kind of narrow. And lastly, current is measured in amperes. So those are the three units. And these graphs are models mathematically of a direct proportion. Voltage is directly proportional to current. And uh, here, current is inversely proportional to resistance. Uh, you're going to try um, Ohm's Law, pages 8 and 9, but we're going to at least set up one together. Uh, and these are real-life applications, a flashlight, um, a toaster oven, a blow dryer. These are things around your house, and these are real values that you might find in them. Uh, so if you put in three batteries into a flashlight, uh, AA's or even D batteries, um, how it works is that if you have three batteries and they're all pointed the same way, um, they're not one's not reversed, then the total voltage adds up. So three 1.5 volt batteries gives you a V total of 4.5 volts. The resistance in the light bulb, because there's only one bulb, or, um, let's, let's assume there is, is 12 ohms of resistance. And the question is, how much is the current flowing through that appliance, that uh, flashlight? And it couldn't be any easier. Um, so far, we've studied current and now Ohm's law, uh, and the voltage is 4.5 volts over 12 ohms, and because I've already done this, 0.375 amps. I'm sure you could have gotten that on your calculator just as easily. So you're going to be doing uh, one, two, three more, four, five, uh, let's see, yep, one, two, three, uh, two, three, and four uh, on this page, and then one through four on page nine. Let me know if you have any questions. Looking forward to discussing.